Uh, one of the things is uh, the way of irrigation. They have those uh, those things that uh, sprinkle water in uh, certain um, how do you call it? in certain times and <clears throat> all over the places where they need irrigation. Yeah, we have in our garden. We using. Yeah. Sorry. We are using in our garden the Israeli technology here. In your garden, where where yeah, are yeah. You, where are you from, Jimmy? Australia. Australia. Oh. Yeah. Down under. <laughs> I read the book. I can't forget. Okay. Yeah. That's my speech for tonight. Hi, Leo. Hi, Leora. Hi, Shay. Hi. Good to see you all. If it's okay, just put your camera on because it's not nice when uh, Geshema would come and see just black. Uh... Thank you, Shmuel. <laughs> so just know that Geshema just uh, will arrive soon. And she asked to tell you that she is really waiting for see all of us again. So she will explain it when uh, she was arrived. Hi, Shirley. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Geshima. We are so happy that you are with us today. And yeah. Bridget, here is if you can put your camera on, it will be nice. Hi, Gishima. Gishima. Sorry, I, did, I had a hard time doing this for some reason. I couldn't switch on the camera. <laughs> oh, okay. How, how uh, we start the recording. You are now a co host. Uh, okay, thank and you. And I will give you the place. Great, thank so you. Thank you again. Sure. All right. Thank you for asking, Barda. My father's better. Thanks. It's actually his wife was quite sick. Okay. 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 Anyway, um, let's start with a motivation, with a meditation to set the right kind of motivation. So just focus on your breathing. And then visualize in the space in front of you a large open lotus that symbolizes renunciation, on top of which lies a sun disk, symbolizing wisdom. And on top of that lies a moon disk that is symbolic of compassion. And then seated on those three is your own Lama in the aspect of Buddha Shakyamuni.
It was the embodiment of all enlightened beings. Buddha's body is made of golden light and he wears the saffron colored robes of a monk. He's seated in the full lotus posture. His right hand is in the earth touching gesture. His left is resting in his lap in the meditation gesture, holding a bagging bowl. Buddha's face is beautiful, radiant, and inspiring. A smiling, compassionate gaze is directed at you and simultaneously at all other sentient beings who are surrounding you. Now direct your attention at these endless sentient beings. Imagine that they all appear as human, as human beings. All of them have at some point in the past extremely close to you. And like us, they're afflicted by their root misperception and the resulting self-centeredness, attachment, anger, and so on. uncontrollably experiencing endless problems, difficulties, grief, worry, and lots of other dissatisfactory states of mind. So based on a sense of connectedness, all of us being caught in cyclic existence generate affectionate love, which sees sentient beings just as ourselves as lovable, as deserving to be loved. Based on a sense of closeness and acceptance of their good qualities as well as their flaws.
and then focusing specifically on all their unwanted experiences, all their sufferings and the causes of these sufferings. Let's generate great compassion. An affectionate state of mind that sincerely wishes all sentient beings to be free from the three types of sufferings. To be free from their samsaric experiences. And that wishes to personally help them in overcoming all their samsaric experiences. To actualize their fullest potential. And that aspiration in the form of great compassion then strengthens and gives way to the altruistic attitude that is completely determined all that is necessary to do all we can to assist sentient beings in their effort to overcome samsara and its causes. And since this is realistically only possible, since we're only, since we can only effectively benefit sentient beings once we become enlightened, let's generate the aspiration or even determination to become a fully enlightened Buddha, to actualize our fullest potential for the benefit of each and every sentient being. And let's think that it's also with this mind, with this mind of enlightenment, that we will continue to study this text on mind training. So while holding on to our motivation, let's take refuge and once again generate bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. All right. Okay, so we 
Here we go. Let's start with, I think there's one question left. Oops, where is it? Here we go. Yeah. Um, this is Jimmy's fourth question, I believe. I think the third I pretty much answered. How do we meet our right Buddhist teacher? Um, well, it's uh, some people meet the Buddhist teacher pretty much at the beginning of their practice. It just depends. Um, but usually it's like a slow process, should be a slow process of analyzing, of investigating the different spiritual masters there are. Like, well, for instance, as far as the Dalai Lama. Yes? So I guess we already answered this one. I already did. Okay, okay. All right. Yeah, okay. you already answered it. I only did. Okay. Then I'll yeah. answer the fourth one. What language does the Buddha speak? It is said that the Buddha speaks to everyone in his or her own language that he or she understands. Why is that so? Hmm. Speaks to everyone in his or her own language. Yeah. This is how the story goes. I mean, this is how it's reported that when the Buddha gave teachings, Buddha Shakyamuni, 2,600 years ago, um, everyone understood, basically. So people spoke different languages, different dialects. I mean, even nowadays in India, there's so many different languages spoken in different areas. So people understood. And what's fascinating, and it's really difficult to, to see how that is possible. Like, how could everyone understand? Um, so I guess maybe literally that was true, but also I think there's more than that. Um, more than that, in the sense that if there's an enlightened being, a being who lives what they teach, then they can communicate that to us in ways in which an ordinary person could never do. Now, what comes to mind is is almost the Dalai Lama. I think I talked to you about this before. I don't remember now, but um, yeah, I, I think I must have mentioned it, that a lot of people report for instance, some of the higher geshes. So higher geshes in the sense like really learned, really um, well-trained geshes who may not know much about Westerners, uh, may not know so much about the West and have a sense you can only understand the Dharma, which is rightly so, if you study it in all its depth and so forth. And so then they hear His Holiness's talk and they have a sense, oh my God, that was so deep. That was so incredible. And they look around and they see all these foreigners taking notes and they're aware that these foreigners have come here for the first time and they think, how can they understand anything? That was so deep. They never studied the Dharma. How can they understand it? And the thing is that when you talk to these Westerners, they all got something. It may not be all the same, but everyone gets something from these teachings in a way that is homeless speaks to everyone. Okay, in this case, uh, it's Tibetan and then it's translated, but here we're not talking about a Buddha like Buddha Shakyamuni, I mean, a historical Buddha, as so the Buddha is described. Um, even though his homes, of course, may as well may well be enlightened. But the point is that everyone benefits from his homeless's teachings in so many different ways. Anyway, so in that sense, that would be an example of how everyone gets something from it. Even if they speak a different language, somehow they understood the Buddha, I guess. Maybe they did hear their own language. I, I don't know. But what kind of Buddha are we talking about here? Well, I already indicated Buddha Shakyamuni is like sometimes described as the historical Buddha. Um, is Shakyamuni Buddha still our present teacher? Well, yeah. First of all, the Buddha is still around. Buddha Shakyamuni is still around. There are other traditions who would say that the mental continuum of the Buddha uh has been severed, has has is, is severed, is no I mean the Buddha is no longer around. But from the point of view of the Nalanda tradition, that is impossible because the mind cannot any mind cannot stop to it cannot stop existing. It's impossible for a mind to at some point go totally out of existence. Just as material material, I mean matter cannot go out of existence, can only transform it to a different matter, into different physical, into a different physical entity. Likewise, a mind can only transform. So therefore the Buddha's mind is still around, but of course we, he, the Buddha can't communicate uh, directly to us in the form of Buddha Shakyamuni as he appeared 2,600 years ago. 
Uh, but through our spiritual masters, through, of course, the texts that are still available, available. So you would still say he's your present teacher, except, or he's our present teacher, except we, as ordinary beings, have no longer, we have no way to, to meet him. Or is it some other Buddha? Well, if His Holiness the Dalai Lama is a Buddha and we consider him to be our teacher, then His Holiness is also a teach is also our teacher. So there are more than one Buddhas. But right now, the teachings that we follow are the teachings of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. So he's st isn't Shakyamuni still the presently residing Buddha in our world system? Well, not physically residing, but still residing. Uh, but then there are other Buddhas, other historical Buddhas are still residing. But I guess his teachings that were, from a Buddhist point of view, re reintroduced to this world. So according to Buddhist history, if you like, um, before Buddha Shakyamuni, there were other historical Buddhas. So there were other Buddhas in the past. Now, I don't know how far that clashes possibly with the uh, with the the teachings on evolution as described by Charles Darwin. It's like, when was that Buddha? Like how many thousands of years ago was it? Was there a civilization or not? I don't know. Um, and sometimes that's a little confusing, but without going into detail, according to Buddhist scriptures, it says that before Buddha Shakyamuni uh, came to this world, well, there wasn't any Buddhist teachings as such. Buddhism didn't exist as the system, uh, as, the, the, as it, the way it exists nowadays. But so Buddha reintroduced it, and I'm saying reintroduced Buddhism to this world because there were other Buddhas, other historical Buddhas who did the same. And then the teachings degenerated, they became non-existent until beings karma, sentient beings, humans karma was ready, was 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 such that they were ready to receive the teachings, interested in the teaching, uh, had the karma from the teachings to appear, and so Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, taught them in our world system. So, Buddha Shakyamuni, still present right now, is in the Sambhogakaya form. Yes, in, uh, definitely every Buddha exists in the Sambhogakaya form. But also, so Sambhogakaya is uh, basically the way the Buddha actually exists, if you want to kind of put it that way. And it's like the the original, like the the state in which a person becomes enlightened, becomes enlightened in the Sambhogakaya, the body becomes the Sambhogakaya, the mind, well, the Buddha's mind, then the enlightened mind, and then they appear in the Sambhogakaya. And then they manifest all these different uh, emanations, all these different manifestations. They're emanated in, in the form of uh, Nimmanakayas, in the form of uh, emanation bodies. And Buddha Shakyamuni was a emanation body of the Buddha who has a particular Sambhogakaya. So all of us, it is said, will at some point, once we become enlightened, we will then um, appear in the form, I mean, we'll become enlightened. We then exist in the form of the Sambhogakaya that is only accessible, that is only visible to bodhisattvas who have realized emptiness directly. And in order to then communicate with others, we will emanate different manifestations. And at some point, I mean, if you think we live in a galaxy of million, billions, billions of other galaxies, um, in, in systems of uh, world systems, which, which exist together with other billions of world systems. So in this huge universe, it makes perfectly sense that there are different worlds similar to ours where maybe a Buddha is right now giving a teaching or in another world where the Buddha's teachings have disappeared. So there are all these historical Buddhas, if you like, Buddhas who introduce the teachings newly to a particular world. And at some point, once we become enlightened, we will also, due to our karmic connection to other beings, um, become a historical Buddha in some world system which is why, well, there, there are many historical Buddhas. So in our world right now, it's Buddha Shakyamuni's teachings who are still around, who are still present, and that's why he is called the historical Buddha at this time. In the future, when the teachings have disappeared and a new Buddha comes to then to reintroduce them, well, the Buddha will be Buddha Maitreya, will be a, a new historical Buddha. 
isn't the isn't in actuality. So could we say the say the that the passing called Shakyamuni who appeared in Thailand South India was just Guru Shakyamuni, but not Buddha Shakyamuni. He was also Buddha Shakyamuni. All the emanations of uh, a Sambhogakaya, which is a Buddha, a Sambhogakaya is a Buddha. Uh, then also the emanations are Buddhas. Therefore, Buddha Shakyamuni, the Nirmanakaya, the supreme Nirmanakaya, in which Buddha's uh, Sambhogakaya emanated. Um, it's also a Buddha. Isn't it actually the Sambhogakaya from our own, from uh, the Sambhogakaya form, our only teacher, and all others are just the speech of the Buddha? No, no, they're, they're also persons. They're not just speech, but they're beings. They're emanated uh, Buddha forms, if you like, but not actual Buddhas. No, they're actual Buddhas. They're considered to be actual Buddhas. So this is hard for us to to fathom because we have one mind and we we exist at the form of one body um, in the form of one body so simply because we're so self-obsessed we can only exist in the form of this one body and that's difficult enough to control everything and um, well we're not in control basically so we have this mind this body these two are comically connected but there's not that much control However, if we can remove our misperception, if we can remove the afflictions, and more than that, based on the mind of enlightenment, then eventually become fully enlightened, then our mind has the capacity to not only exist in the form of one body, just having one physical aspect, but we can, you know, very in a totally controlled fashion, uh, manifest in the form of different emanations, in the form of different Buddhas, which, yeah, right now it's like, how does that even work? But of course, that is done for the benefit of sentient beings. Uh, and so it's a necessity. Anyway, so is, is Buddha Shakyamuni in, in the form of this Nirmanakaya, in the form of this emanation in which he came to this world 2,600 years ago, an actual Buddha? The answer is yes. If yes, it is so, then I find it totally impossible that the Dalai Lama would be a Buddha. Well, he's not a historical Buddha. It's not like he introduced the teachings newly. Um, after they had disappeared, but he can only be Guru Dalai Lama who teaches Buddha Shakyamuni's doctrine, but he's definitely not Buddha Dalai Lama. I would say, I mean, if his holiness, of course, we don't know if he is, but if he were, if he is a, a Buddha, if he's fully enlightened, then we can say Buddha Dalai Lama, Buddha Shakyamuni. What is the difference? As I said, uh, Buddha Shakyamuni emanated or appeared in the form of a historical Buddha. Okay, I hope that it explained it or answered this and if it didn't please ask again Jimmy all right then let's do a little bit of Lamrim um, we've started to talk about uh, generosity the first of the six perfections and I guess with everything we do here it's important to check how much can I do how much can I improve? How much is there room for improvement? Well, I guess we can all agree there is. Can I be more generous as I've been so far? And how should I practice generosity? Of course, studying uh, and hopefully practicing uh, the 7.9 training, our practice revolves around bodhicitta, generating the mind of enlightenment as part of our formal practice but also as part of our daily life and doing so it's important then to engage in the six far-reaching attitudes as it's they're called here or the six perfections as they also describe the six paramitas the first one being generosity it's the first one since it's said to be easier than the other ones um it's in terms of their uh, how difficult it is to practice these, that's their order. But generosity, well, as we've heard before, it's basically the mental attitude or mental state that wants to give, depending on what is given. There are three kinds of giving, so there are different objects that can be given. And then based on that wish to give, an actual giving in the form of verbal or physical giving. Now, the first type Again, it's the easiest, giving material aid, which maybe in this day and age when owning things, when having things uh, is so much part of our day-to-day -day life, I'm wondering whether it's not 
easier for some people, for a lot of people, to practice the other two, giving protection from fear or giving the Dharma. I guess in this day and age, and this is also to do with, well, the insurance companies and then the advertising that is done by these insurance companies, like this fear of not having enough. Like it's 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 like this gives us a sense of security, our our wealth, our our the possessions we have, and to give them away is scary for a lot of people. So it's important to practice generosity in a in a an effective or in a in a careful way, not to be put off by it. So we can start off just practicing generosity of material objects. Um, in a in a mental in a mental way to mentally just visualize we give everything everything we own to sentient beings and we we keep it for now to be able to practice the dharma to to practice as much as we can of course we do other things as well but to focus on yes very much so using our life to uh, practice the different methods that were prescribed by the buddha so in that way it, to be like a like be to be someone who's just taking care of this wealth we have of the, the the possessions we have, but for the benefit of others, that would be the first step. But then, I guess to realize we have far more than we need, and maybe to reduce it uh, by giving away some of the things, and not necessarily just the old stuff we don't need. Uh, so don't want to throw it away, I just give it to someone. Um, no, but to reduce, first of all, reduce not in the sense of giving away what I don't need uh, or what I don't want, but to reduce it in the sense that I have more time. Because if we have too much, we're so busy cleaning all the time. I mean, I, like being in the West right now, I mean, when I look around, people have so much stuff. So they're really, like, their whole day is very much spent on, not their whole day, but they spend a lot of time just looking after their things, um, cleaning it, taking care of it, having it fixed when it's broken and then it breaks again. And then, oh yeah, so it's like, whether it's cars or apartments, houses, whatever, I mean, they're filled uh, up to the ceiling with stuff that is, is really not needed. So to relieve ourselves of this burden, I mean, it's such a burden. Of course, we need basic objects. We need those. What I find terrible is the way people buy clothes all the time. It's like what they, I mean, of course, if it tears, if it's all broken down, but just in terms of the environment to buy stuff all the time and people don't know what to do with their old clothes anymore because they feel like they have to buy new stuff all the time. The goods, the old stuff is still okay. So they're trying to sell it, but no one buys it. So they try to give it away, but no one wants it. Um, if there's an earthquake, they're like, yeah, I can give away some of my old clothes. I can buy some new ones. I mean, <laughs> I watch it all the time. It's, 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 terrible like these these places where you can bring clothes and they're like don't bring us all your clothes we've got enough so like buying clothes all the time I mean just buy something that lasts for a long time that's of good quality that is timeless that you can wear I don't know that doesn't get out of fashion if that's important to you and just why keep buying 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 all the time it's incredible uh, to look around how people obsessively buy new clothes all the time and don't know what to do with the new stuff. So that's one thing. Um, so in that way, to give away, of course, what we don't need and keep the most basic because otherwise we've got no time. And time is running out. I mean, we're moving every day closer to our own death. I mean, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but that's just that's just reality. So if we spend all our life to look after things that we leave behind when we die anyway, what kind of life is that? So to reduce, to really reduce what we have. Um, and in that way, also practice generosity. And of course, if we can, without giving away this stuff, well, no, but don't give away things that you're really attached to because you're just going to buy it again or try to get it back. But yeah, so to see is there room for giving more, giving a little bit more than before? Or, of course, money in that way. Uh, it's not really, well, we're attached to money, but more the amount than the actual note. Um, so 
seeing whether I can give a little bit more. Second, giving protection from fear, which basically means helping others. Not in terms of giving the Dharma, because that's the third point, but just being there for others, giving our time, which of course at this day and age uh, is again something we don't have much of. But again, give as much as we can to make time for others to be with them when they have worry. I mean, here fear, that's how it's described, but its it, it includes also uh, helping others to overcome their problems. So fear, of course, fear from suffering. And then that way, if you help them to help them with a problem, help them with something that which which would otherwise lead to fear. So you, then you're protecting them from fear. But just to be there for others when they're in need of a friend, that would be giving you time. That is protection from fear. And then, of course, giving the Dharma. And giving the Dharma means more than that, means also um, not just giving teachings or, I don't know, giving away books or teaching a course on meditation, but to give the Dharma by being an example, by putting the Dharma into practice, of course, be, be, being an example of, of the Dharma, that is also giving the Dharma. So in that way, as our great masters, our lamas, teach through their examples and through their actual words, through the, the teachings they give. So those are all examples of generosity. And I'm sure there are other types of generosity, um, but they're all included in those three, I, I, it's, I would say. All right, so those three. But these three also contain the other six. So the other um, perfections or far-reaching attitudes are all included or can all be included in the first one, for instance. So, of course, there's giving. This is something Haribhata, for instance, talks about in his commentary uh, on the Perfectional Wisdom Sutra. So he talks about, for instance, um, well, let's say giving material objects, material aid or material objects. And, of course, here, giving what is not harmful to the other person, giving um, what is appropriate, giving when it's needed and so forth. I mean, of course, but without going into that right now, but giving, of course, with ethical discipline. So when you give, you give in combination with ethics, without lying, without deceiving another person, without wanting something in return. So it's like selfless giving. I guess that could be included in the in the in the ethical form of giving. So yeah, not to engage in any kind of unethical giving. And in that way, you could also say not giving objects, well, don't give drugs to a drug addict, for instance. Um, yeah, so in that way, you have an ethical discipline as part of your, your generosity. And then you've got patience, to be patient while giving. Even if the other person, for instance, doesn't, I don't know, fall on their knees because you've just been so generous. Maybe if they hardly even thank you for it, well, to not get upset, but instead to be happy, to be grateful to the person that they've given you the opportunity to give, right? So it's not wishing, not feeling the other person has to be grateful to you, but instead to be grateful to the person to give you the opportunity to practice giving. Then there is enthusiasm or joyful enthusiasm, joyful effort. Well, that it makes perfectly sense that we do so joyfully. Oh, joyful, joyful giving is important. And also uh, making an effort, like a, a joyful enthusiasm so that we not, don't just do it once, but we, we continuously do it with this, with this, well, joyful effort in the sense that, um, We've, we let go of the object. So if you're really attached to it, if then you give it away, the problem could be that it turns into um, regret, having given, some, having given something, and that kind of regret is unfortunately a negative type of uh, regret. Um, it's one of the afflictions. I mean, it's not mentioned as one of the afflictions, but I can think of at least two types of mind 
that are afflictions, but they're never mentioned as part of the afflictions just because it's so obvious. One of them is regretting a, 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 a positive action, regretting a positive action. Regretting a negative action is a mental factor that is positive, but regretting a, a positive action, that is a mental factor that is negative. So it makes sense to, to include it in the afflictions. To say it's an afflictive emotion, so this regret of having given to someone. The second is rejoicing in the problems another person has. In, in German, we call it Schadenfreude. Um, yeah, basically feeling joyful about the problems other people have. We had this discussion, Leora and I, we, we talked about this before. Can you be joyful when something happens to a person who's um, who, who does something negative? And so the answer would be joyful in the sense that they stop, if, if it stops them from harming themselves and others, we can be joyful that now this person can no longer harm themselves and others. So just that aspect, but not wishing for them for them to, some, to, to suffer, to have problems and difficulties and so forth, that would be a kind of affliction. And that would be uh, the opposite of rejoicing in in the good, in, in the positive aspects other people experience. Anyway, returning to um, generosity, it needs to be done joyfully, and that can only be done joyfully if attachment, the strongest type of attachment is not there because otherwise we'll regret it and that's a problem. So joyful giving with joyful effort. Focused, we should be focused while we give to have the right kind of motivation uh, to remember also the emptiness. And that brings me to wisdom, having wisdom. Well, wisdom, of course, is necessary in order to give the right kind of objects at the right amount or the right kind of person to, to not give drugs to a drug addict and so forth um so in the in, in, to those who need it etc but also wisdom that understands that the giver in this case ours we ourselves doesn't exist inherently the object that is given doesn't exist inherently the receiving the person who receives the gift doesn't exist inherently and the action doesn't exist inherently so to focus on that so to have concentration focusing on that uh, on this aspect that is part of wisdom and of course having wisdom to reflect on that so in that way giving becomes very meaningful uh, and you may want to meditate on that at home before you give sit down go through these six because then you have a complete practice you practice it's like six in one <laughs> like when you go to the supermarket and you buy two in one and it feels like a <laughs> whoa just I've been so lucky I got two in one. Well, here you got six in one, so it's totally worth it. All right. Okay. So that's it on generosity for this week. So I'm not going to be like, oh, if you feel like practicing, you could do that. I'll just do it. Oh, come on. Life is too short. I mean, just do it. Just practice this. I mean, try it. Give it at least a try. I mean, you've done it already. Well, do more of it if you can. No, leave out this if you can. All right, Leo, are you raised your hand? Please unmute yourself. I have a question, if I may, about the sure. motive of generosity. Yeah. I had one a dis once a discussion with a friend with Annie Lofton. Mm -hmm. uh, she presented the opinion that um, if a drug user or alcoholic um, asks for money, and uh, he probably would like to buy a drink or dose or something. She would give him because she knows she's been there. She was alcoholic and she knows the suffering. And she, if she can help him to release it, it's an unbearable suffering. She wouldn't stand. She would give him. Mm. And uh, I said that uh, I would hate to be the person who might give him the dose which might kill him. Mm -hmm. I never do it. I might offer him uh, something to eat or something, but not money. Mm -hmm. And we thought that the, it's debatable. No one answer. Depends on the motive, motivation. I have to be sincere to see that I, I don't uh, prevent myself from uh, uh, giving just because I want to save the money and not being honest. I have to make sure that motivation is right, and then I might make, I don't know what's the right thing to do. 
So mm. our, uh, or we discuss once with Tutan children, mm. when a, a terrorist, um, a rich person gives money mm-hmm. to what he believes a good cause, cause mm-hmm. 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 they spend it to, 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 for terrorism. Mm-hmm. It's generosity because it's wish to give. He wishes to give and he's mm. giving for what he believes a good cause. Mm. But many people will suffer from it. Mm. So how uh, important is the intention here for mm. Egypt giving? I think it's the intention and wisdom. But of course, in the end, um, we will never be able to give like a Buddha. So knowing exactly, I mean, what are the consequences of my actions um, in the long term, etc. So I guess we, we just need to use common sense in the case of the, the, the drug abuse. Um, maybe there are different ways. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't want to give any suggestions on that. But yeah, I, I guess to give as much as we can to avoid long-term suffering and to avoid uh, suffering that includes as, as many as, I mean, avoid suffering uh, that affects more people than necessary. You see what I'm saying? Like, I mean, in the end, it's long-term suffering versus short-term that we should avoid and when it harms others well as as the least amount of people that we could possibly but we don't know in the end we don't know so our intention should be as much as we can combined with common sense yeah i i don't have a good answer to that <laughs> sorry uh yeah. varda please yeah uh, yeah i wanted to add or to put another way of thinking about it, because I heard Anilo Sang also, and sometimes um, I thought that uh, if somebody asks you, mm-hmm. that there's difference with a, a beggar that sits in the street and asks if whatever you do, you do, and mm. another that comes to you and asks you, or puts his hand towards you or something. Maybe when he's sitting, he's asking also. Mm. But what is our place in judging his motive? So if he asks, uh, 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 do we have to decide if it is good for him or not good for him? I, I mean, I guess in that moment we're put in a place where we're trying to decide. I mean, I, I guess it is good to take that person to consideration but i i don't know i mean am i giving them money because i know they're going to get the next drink i i think that's the discussion here right like they want to buy another drink i know that for certain do i want to support that but me not giving them money will that make a difference or is it yeah i don't know i personally in that situation i would think I would give them some food. I would not want to support their habit in any way. Yeah, I would just buy them some food. But but whoever said that it was better in that moment maybe to get them a drink, I'm sure there's more more to it. There's more to the story, and I don't know the rest of it. To me, it would first make sense, you know, to stop an addict from drinking more. I mean, that would be every situation is different so if i know them better and i don't know if if i don't give them the money now the next thing they do is rob a bank or prostitute themselves in order to get the drink i might as well you know but i I just don't know sorry again it's it's really hard we try to do our best and we make mistakes of course yeah okay great thank you (laughs) All right. Um, can you still see the screen? No. Okay. I'll, I'll do this this thing again. Uh, just a sec. Okay. All right. Let's go back. Um, so let's go to the text. I quickly go through the text again just to remind you. Oh, no. These are the questions. But, yeah, generosity here, it's, it's great that you're right away digging into 
what can you give to the other person? But maybe let's start basically also with giving that's a little safer, uh, not to be put off by like, how much can I give? And I mean, just get the guy a sandwich, you know, and then let's slowly uh, think of situations where it's not that easy. Okay. All right. So we go back to this incredible, beautiful text, which is beautiful. Why? Well, because there's something for everyone. And it can be taken in a way that is easy. There are practices we can all do on a on a on an easier level. And then of course there are practices that are very difficult and can only be done once you're on an advanced level. But there's something for everyone. And I guess when we go through this text, I mean we do it together here. And I do this over and over because every time we have a different understanding, but just the fact we go over it one more time, uh, the explanations may be a little different from before. If we do it on our own, we take different commentaries and in that way learn, again, different perspective. But the point is like every time we go through it in the back of our mind, there should always be the question, can I take this on? Is this something I can do right now? Certain things we can do right now, other things, depending on our situation, our circumstances, maybe less, maybe less, may, may speak to us in, in, in not the same way. And that, of course, changes again. But to think every time, can I practice this? When and where? When and where? Can I do this? So in my life right now, can I bring this in? Can I make this part of my life? Can I fit it in? I'm busy if I've got some free time, I'm busy surfing the internet. <laughs> I don't know. But the point is, even while doing all this, can I bring it into my life? So that is so important to always check which part of this, which part of this I can actually integrate, which part I can internalize, if you like. So without going into the beginning part, there are times when it's talk more about these first verses, but diving right into the uh, seven, the seven points. So we have the preliminaries. Well, I've always skipped the preliminaries to a certain degree, but we shouldn't do that. I mean, not at all times, because the preliminaries are just as important as everything else to remember every now and then, and especially when things are tough. And of course, we're in samsara. We can expect things to be tough. We can expect problems to arise. It's just part of life. So to remember we have a precious human existence. I mean, if we look around, and right now I'm in the West, I mean, there's no one around me who's interested in the Dharma. Or they're like, yeah, that's nice. Oh, that's lovely. Maybe they ask a question or two, and that's it. So actually, all the other opportunities and freedoms, most of them they have, the people around me have. But there's one thing missing, interest. Interest in such a way that they would actually want to learn about this and actually apply this to their life. And that is so precious. I'm not even talking about faith in the Dharma, you know, like going all the way like, whoa, the Dharma, that's it. But just an openness and an, and, and an interest that is strong enough to, to do something with it. That is so precious. Our billions of people in this world, even those calling themselves Buddhist, who are culturally Buddhist. Many of them don't have the time. They don't do it. Maybe on a special fight or the holiday, they go to the temple and burn an incense to be to be more successful in their business and so forth. But no, I'm I'm talking about applying these psychological methods to your own life. That is so precious. That you have that kind of you're that kind of person. That is so rare. It's so rare. It'd be nice if there were more people, but. Well, the Sangha is pretty small. And so realizing this and the sense of, I am so lucky. Yeah, everything is going down. My life is like a mess. Everything is messy. Okay. All right. But there's a solution. I have an interest in the solution. I am so lucky. I mean, we need to spend more time to just be grateful for what we have. And to not give away this opportunity, this that we created this opportunity is 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 incredible. 
I mean, how many people have created the causes for that in their past lives? So let's continue creating the causes for that. Continue to make an effort that we have the same opportunities in the future. And let's not forgive. Let's not forget we may die any time. Death is what ends this precious human life. So to, to make every moment meaningful, to not waste it. And what is the best way to make it meaningful? To avoid harmful actions and accumulate beneficial actions as much as we can. So that should be our foundation. These are the preliminaries. And when things are rough, remember what you've got. It's incredible and so, so rare. It's so rare. I mean, there's so many rich people in this world, so many people who have a lot of luxury. They have the luxury of time. And they're not interested at all. It's just beyond me. How can you not think this is the most amazing thing? But they're just not. Um, and so if you have this interest, it's precious. It's truly precious. So precious human rebirth is really this. Interest that goes beyond just saying, oh, no, how nice. And that's it. No, an interest that motivates you to put this into practice. All right. So that seems pretty basic. And it is pretty basic. But it's the foundation. And then we jump right into the awakening mind. Can I do this? Of course you can do it. Everyone can do it. People have done it in the past. I mean, come on. If they did it, if they can do it. We can all do it. It's just a matter of putting our mind to it, making the time. And yeah, there's, there's a sense of urgency should really develop in our mind, not to put it off. Oh, maybe tomorrow I postpone it. No, because we don't know what comes first. Our next life. Or, or, well, tomorrow in this existence. So let's do it. We can all do it. No excuses. Everyone can do this. The Buddhas in the past did it. So they were just like us at some point. Therefore, to train our mind in the awakening mind. To be aware that all our trouble comes from self-centeredness. Yes, we can blame the government. We can blame the terrorists. We can blame this and that and all this. Yes, they also, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're not, they haven't done terrible things and they, they cause trouble in our life. But the main cause is self-centeredness in all of us, in all of us. And it's not saying we're bad people, but we have this rude misperception. If you have the rude misperception, you have self-centeredness. That's it. There's no other way. It's like, I don't know, if you've got, if you've got snow, you've got cold. That's it. It's cold. It gets cold. If it snows, it gets cold. That's it. So similarly... If you, have, if you have the misperception of reality, you have self-centeredness. And self-centeredness is that which causes our experiences. It's that which is mainly responsible. So, And that's not us. Let's not identify with you. Let's not take it as a reason to hate yourself. I mean, come on. There's self-centeredness. And we talk about my self-centeredness, which shows that there's an I which exists separate from the self-centeredness. Yes, Snehi. Yes, please. Geshe Ma, I just noticed in the paragraph that, you know, traditionally the um, ultimate awakening mind is taught first, but Lama Tsongkhapa reverses it. I was wondering why why he chose to do that. It's not Lama Tsongkhapa, it's Pabanga Rinpoche who reversed okay. it. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, it is, yes, definitely the ultimate awakening mind is usually mentioned first. Pabanga Rinpoche, that's his addition we follow, and I follow it because the Solomon's the Dalai Lama follows it. Um, and it's got a lot of aspects that other texts don't have. But yeah, in this case, huh, it's kind of, it's also nice to start with this. It's It seems like being thrown right into the ultimate nature of all phenomena. Uh, I like this order in a way. It's like training our mind first in compassion, love, and so forth, and then uh, turn towards how phenomena really exist i mean the other way it's better actually it's had to be better in terms of it's more stable if you understand that phenomena don't exist inherently and so forth it's more stable but in, in some situation it's also nice to start with that it will make sense then um that well it, it kind of strengthens it again but i don't know i can you can see it from both sides and see, say it both has its merits and just from the point of view of reasoning and so forth, it should really be the ultimate first. But Lama Tsongkhapa, I mean, Pabongo Rinpoche also doesn't explain it. It just says that in other texts, 
uh, the other one comes first, but it doesn't explain it. So I don't know. Um, sorry. <laughs> anyway, so banish your blames to the single source. Towards all beings, contemplate their great kindness. Okay, we're not saying all sentient beings are bod bodhisattvas. That's silly. No, but we need sentient beings just as we need the Buddha or Buddhas. So that's why Shantideva says we need Buddhas and sentient beings equally to become Buddhas. So why do we honor Buddhas? What's the what's the point in honoring Buddhas but neglecting and not respecting sentient beings? Just just simply from from the point of view of them being one of the causes of us becoming enlightened, becoming actualizing our fullest potential, and especially the ones that are difficult to love, especially those ones. They give us this opportunity. So great, great kindness doesn't mean to to give give way to their demands or give in to their demands or what have you. No, to be of course strict when it needs to be when it when the person needs to be strict with someone who would use us or whatever they would do with us, like on the personal level. Of course, we wouldn't allow them to to use us or to use other people, but. Still, to see that aspect, to to perceive that part of their, that part of that person, their great kindness, this is something that the Tibetans have a really beautiful way. It's part of their culture, pretty much, where they can actually, in some cases, differentiate between the different aspects of the person and the person themselves. To give you an example, maybe it's a little far fetched, but I think it's a good example. There's certain, I, I can think of one nun, at least where I live, she has some mental problems, um, serious mental issues, but she's a nun. Um, and so sometimes she misbehaves in front of everyone during his home's his teaching. She fights with people, uh, she causes disruption. And the Tibetans are very respectful towards her, but also stern. They have this nice mixture between, between like, like respectful between respectful, but also saying, come on now, it's enough, sit down, right? So where does that respect come from? Because they see the vows or they, they focus on the vows this nun has taken. They have respect for the Buddhist vows she has taken. But then the parts, when they discipline her, when they're like, come on now, sit down, your son is there, just stop fighting. Uh, and they, 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 they discipline her. Then they're focusing, focusing on the aspect that needs to be disciplined. So they see they see this nun as not one being as one with her negative behavior and you just ah, and just look at her with like anger and, and aversion but rather differentiate have respect for the and so forth so in the same way we can do that we can see at the different aspects there are the negative aspects and those need to be addressed but there's also just the fact that they are an object that helps us to generate qualities which we we that which are really precious and they are the solution to all our problems. So to consider sentient beings also in that way, and not to have this aversion by seeing them as a lump of just negativity. Very important. This way of looking at the world, we, we're not even aware of it. We see this person, we put a label on them, bad, and then all everything about them is just bad. But there's so much more. Everyone is so much more. And to have, as Sunday Deva says, respect, to respect also the good qualities, but also be aware of the negative ones and address them in an appropriate way. Anyway, having said that, then comes the actual practice. So based on an understanding, my experiences are the result of my own self-centeredness. That's it. That comes first before everything else. And sentient beings can actually, and that self-centeredness can never, can never be helpful unless I use it as a tool to become enlightened. But really all these tools, I'm using them, I'm using my self-centeredness to destroy it. We're sentient beings. They're precious at all times. I'm not using them to destroy them. No, they're precious. In the beginning of my practice, in the beginning, in the middle of my practice, and at the end of my practice, they're always precious. Okay, so with this in mind, I can then train in giving and taking, giving and taking. So visualize this. And visualizing this, it seems like a waste of time. Why, why would you visualize? It's not even realistic. You're not even taking away the suffering. 
It's not about realistic in that sense. It's about strengthening your mind, getting the virtue, getting the virtue that helps you to control your mind better, to generate more love and compassion, to generate these qualities we all need. I mean, the world needs these qualities and we can't implant them on others. We can, we can take personal responsibility for developing them in ourselves. So through this powerful practice, it is so powerful, even though it's not realistic. I mean, we're not taking on the suffering of others, in other words, but it's ineffective in so many other ways. It gives us incredible mental strength and it helps us to understand what we can actually do. I mean, initially we're like uh, becoming a Buddha, we're becoming like as Holman as the Dalai Lama. No, this is not, it's not, when we feel like I can become like that, that's not, that's not stupid or anything. That is like, that's realistic. We can, it's not saying we are already. No, far from it. But we can, we can, I can become just like his holiness. If his holiness is a Buddha, just like that. If his holiness is a Bodhisattva, I can become more than that. I saw others will do it before me, but <laughs> very likely, but I can, I can become a Buddha. All right. Okay. So in that way, gives us that determination. So the three objects, three poisons and three roots of virtue. So now, what is it I want sentient beings? I want them to overcome the three poisons, the three objects, which are, well, we all know, and and um, I'm sorry, um, unattractive or or negative, negative objects, positive objects, and neutral objects. So objects that trigger happiness in us, objects that trigger unhappiness in us, and those objects that trigger neutral feelings, and then the three poisons that arise as a result of that attachment and so forth, and the three roots of virtue wishing for all sentient beings to be free from those three um, and taking on their non-virtue and instead wishing for them to be free of these three root virtues. So that's what we do as part of our practice of Donglen. And then in, in the post-meditative session, so this is during the session and then out of the session, we try to be mindful of these practices by training ourselves through words. Can we do this? We can all do it. We can all do it. Can we do it like a bodhisattva? No, but we're doing it to get there. So we can all make the time. Let's not waste our time. I mean, the world is is, is pretty uh, crazy right now. I mean, pretty crazy. So, but crazy is good because it gives us many opportunities. It can it can actually encourage us to, to do more, especially when we have problems ourselves. Because when we don't have any problems, we get really lazy. When things are going so smoothly, oh, I don't need the Dharma right now. It's everything is going so smoothly. No, but when we have trouble, that wakes us up. Um, we can use the trouble into, you know, bring it into our practice as we the text teaches us a little further down. But yeah, anyway, so the point is we can all do this and we should do it. All right. Then train ourselves doing all this, but also let's not forget the ultimate awakening mind. Let's not forget emptiness. So when we have some stability, uh, the stability could here come through the conventional, through con conventional bodhicitta. It could give that. Maybe that, that's what is meant here with the stability being attained. Sne, I'm not sure. Teach then the secret. We got all phenomena as dreamlike. So let's not forget, even though we don't understand emptiness, this much we can think. Examine the nature of the unborn awareness. So all phenomena, everything that appears to our mind, appears to our mind in a way in which it doesn't exist. And it's because of our mind, because of our mind being mistaken in a particular way that things appear in a way in which they cannot exist. But this is not just true for the objects that appear to our mind. That is true for the mind itself. Even the mind appears to the mind as existing in and of itself inherently, and it doesn't exist that way. It's also just labeled in the same way as the objects of the mind. And even the mind that reflects on that fact, that is the remedy to our self-centeredness, that doesn't exist the way it appears. And so that's what we should focus on. That's, that's one of our goals, one important goal, the base, the mind basis of all, that is the actual path in the form of the mind that realizes how phenomena really exist. So to not lose sight of that, this is what we're aiming for. In our meditation, spend time every day. This is really what his homeless keeps telling us. Meditate on emptiness, meditate on bodhicitta. Those two. 
We can do this in the meditative session every day. Make a time. Do not neglect this even one day. That makes our day where we start our day in a very meaningful way. And it has, it leaves something behind. It leaves a residue. It, it, it affects us in a really positive way. And then that way we've really taken the essence of our precious human life, but just starting off practicing those two. And then when we arise from this, so as it tells us with the conventional mind, train yourself through words, uh, be mindful in all actions and so forth of the conventional conventional bodhicitta and then the same way to bring our meditation on emptiness into our practice well remember it's all illusions it's all appearances coming from our own mind appearances to our mind that appear to us in a unique way the way the world appears to my mind is different to the way it appears to your mind very different i mean just just because of where you stand right now, literally stand right now, right? You have a different perspective on the objects around you, literally where you are right now, but also, of course, where you are mentally right now, different. And so, therefore, your conjurer, your mind is a conjurer of your illusions. And things don't exist as solidly and concrete as objectively as they seem to us. So to remember that all the time. And then, now, having... Having put this basic, I mean, well, basic in the sense of the two bodhicittas, that's that's what we really need to hold on to, emptiness and bodhicitta, or the two types of bodhicitta, if you want to call them that. And now we, we, we dive into samsara. We basically, yeah, dive into this crazy world where fortunately we have so many adverse conditions that we can utilize them for our practice. All right, so when the world and its inhabitants are filled with negativity, we have now the opportunity to transform any experience into the path of enlightenment. Remember, it doesn't exist inherently. The things appear in a very concrete form, but they don't exist that way. They're labeled without being labeled. They wouldn't exist that way. And to remember as much as we can this. But also, if things go too well for us, it doesn't do us a favor. It's like our body. If we just lie around and sleep, do we do ourselves physically a favor? No, we don't. Our body needs to do exercise, and that means hardships, right? I mean, if you think of just the body, you need to, I don't know, lift things that are heavy, move your body. I mean, if you just lie in the, in the bed, you lose all your muscles. I mean, you lose everything and basically are no longer able to function properly. And in the same way, our body, our mind also needs challenges. So these challenges, if used in the right way, can be extremely powerful. So not to run away from problems, but to face them head on. I'm sure you've got your your own personal problems. Of course, your, your days are filled with problems, the problems of the people around us and the problems of this world, basically. All right. And now to use them to use them to our advantage, to use them to be more in touch with reality. This is samsara. Let's stop looking for some lasting happiness in samsara. Our mind does that automatically. But we need to stop it. We need to become aware of it. Then, so be more realistic when it comes to, to samsara. Also, to generate compassion for other sentient beings, because it's not just our suffering, it's the suffering of other sentient beings, to become stronger, to become more resilient. Resilience is very important, because as part of our Dharma practice, if we don't have actual, if you don't live in an environment full of problems, our Lama will create it for us. Like I was saying, Marba and Melarepa, I mean, Marba just think of Marba, he's the perfect guru, he's considered to be the perfect Lama, why? Because he, he, not just because he taught Milarepa the path to enlightenment, but because he, 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 he exposed him to a lot of negativity, to a lot of problems, not negativity, but problems in that way, to a lot of difficulties, which Milarepa could then utilize for his practice. So if, if we don't have them already, these problems, the lamas will create them for us. The Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, when we're ready, will create them for us. So we don't even know. Maybe, maybe our practice is already on that way that all our negativities are actually emanations of our of of, of our lama, for instance, of 
the spiritual beings around us. Oh, they can take a little bit more. I'll, I'll put a little bit more in that in their way, right? And then to have the courage, whatever there is. So, okay, I can you I can transform it into the path of enlightenment. And so whatever happens, whatever you encounter, make it part of your meditation, make it part of your your practice. An obnoxious person, another difficulty, impermanence, suffering, and so forth. There's there's so much every every aspect of Buddhism can be part, can be part, become part of any difficulty. Precious human rebirth, death, right? You can all make it part of that. Karma, refuge, bodhicitta. I mean, every topic is is directly or indirectly related to any situation. It's it all makes sense. Dependent arising. Big one. Dependent arising. How it's dependent on these three aspects and so forth. To causes and conditions, parts, and labeling. So in that way, anything that happens to us on the especially the difficult that, that bring forth difficult emotions or negative emotions, that is the time to apply it to your meditation. And the fourfold practice is the most. So here, the first three lines describe, usually they're, they're in, in terms of practice, they're, they're, they're two, sometimes two ways of talking about it. So usually, or sometimes in the sense you talk about the thought and the action. The intention and the action, or the thought and the action. So the thought here should be the first three. Well, whatever problems there are, now apply it to your practice. And every situation that arises, and kind of include it in your meditation. And what is the action? What you should do? The fourfold practice that is described as the action. So like. Um, Purifying negativity, accumulating merit, purifying negativities, um, making offerings or, well, I guess benefiting also harmful beings, but also uh, making offerings or asp aspira um, kind of aspiration of prayers or, or kind of asking for assistance to the Dharma protectors, to the great beings and so forth. All right. So in some of the commentaries, the first three are described as thoughts as like a mental attitude we should at all times keep keep present i mean and then engage in these practices so the action of our practice so these the first three are the part of the thought and the first the the fourth line is the action and then to present a lifetime's practice in summary well it's the lifetime practice in terms of the the five powers as we know them so um the five powers what are the the five powers in terms of why we're alive? What are they? Oh, it's time. Time's gone. Okay. This time I take a long time to summarize it, but um, never mind. We're not. There's no time pressure to go through it, and I don't want to just go. Text is done. Okay, what comes next? Now this is something we can go over it time and again, time and again. Um, since we had a huge break this time, two weeks, four weeks. Um, it makes sense to go over it slowly. So I'll continue with uh, five powers next time. And then I guess we'll, we'll get to the point where we got to last time again. But yeah, um, that should do for now. And as to, just a sec, as to the meditation. Well, yeah, let's do some meditation on that. We start again with some breathing meditation, as always, to just let go of any disruptive thoughts and to prepare your mind for the meditation, just focus on your breath.
Then let's take a moment to focus on the fact that not only are we born human, but we have so many freedoms and opportunities that allow us, that enable us to practice the Dharma. And of all these, very important, we have the interest that is strong enough to learn about the Dharma and to put it into practice. This is so rare. And precious. So let's be determined to not waste this precious opportunity. Make our life as meaningful as possible before we die. And how can we make it most meaningful? Well, by practicing the two types of bodhicitta. Conventional bodhicitta. Based on an understanding All our problems, all of suffering, has its root in our self centeredness. And although we usually blame others for our problems, but these others, that is, all sentient beings, are essential in our spiritual development. Therefore, very precious. So, an effective way for us to practice bodhicitta is to do donglen. practice we can all integrate into our daily life. Practice it when we are usually just daydreaming.
or in our meditation session. And we need to also remember ultimate bodhicitta. We need to practice emptiness. No matter how limited our understanding of this ultimate truth may be. Remembering that our reality consists of mere appearances to our mind. Without any of these objects existing objectively, or in and of themselves. Even the mind itself Is merely labeled. Doesn't exist by way of its, of its own character. So while not forgetting the kindness and value of sentient beings, let's also remember the ultimate nature of everything that exists. and take in particular adverse conditions, problems, conflicts, suffering, take it into the path and transform all our difficulties into the path of enlightenment. Ask yourself whether that is something you can do. To immediately apply whatever situation arises, in particular when it's a problem, an unwanted experience, apply it to your practice, your meditation,
And in that way, turn into a cause for your own spiritual development. Accumulate merit whenever there is an opportunity and purify. Through the four powers. making offerings to negative forces, which means particular meditating on love and compassion for those negative forces. And seeking the existence of those who protect the Dharma. Asking to inspire us and help us. If we can make time for this, all these practices, we're truly bringing lojong or mind training into our life. We use our life to transform our mind. Seeing everything as an opportunity. To practice conventional and ultimate bodhicitta. So then let's conclude this short analysis by focusing single-pointedly on any kind of conclusion, any kind of insight you've come to. And focusing on it in such a way that you internalize this insight or this conclusion. so that it may affect our emotions and thereby our daily life.
And then let's dedicate whatever whatever positive potential we've accumulated together. Firstly, of course, towards our own enlightenment by thinking, may this become a cause for us to actualize our fullest potential so that we're of greatest benefit to all sentient beings. And in the meantime, may all this, all this virtue we've accumulated become a cause for our lamas to have long and healthy lives so that they continue to guide us through their example and through their teachings. And may, of course, our virtue also affect all ordinary beings around us. May it inspire others to seek ways to transform their mind and to reduce their aversion, their aggression. and their self-centeredness. So with this in mind, let's recite the prayers together. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chinrezik, Denzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind, not yet born, arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay, thank you. The link, please be in touch with Geshema next week about the uh, summertime in Israel. Next, it doesn't uh, apply on us because it's still six o'clock on Israel. So let's talk to Geshema. Maybe oh, no, it, it changes in Germany. The summertime changes a day after it changes in Israel. So I don't think it affects us at all. It'll all mm -hmm. be the same. Your summertime starts on Friday, on Saturday, right? This yeah, coming yeah. Saturday? Right. Yeah. Well, in Germany, it's Sunday. And so Monday will be on the same. There'll oh. be just one hour difference. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And for everyone else, yeah. well, Thank for everyone you. else, I'm not sure in the US. It will change, change for us. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. Also. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So All right. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.